Good evening. I'm Sean Decatur, president of Kenyon College, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Elite colleges are the subject of a great deal of interest and just plain gossip in the popular media, from the speculations and sometimes scandal that surrounds questions of who gets in and who doesn't, to the endless game of rankings, often based at least in part on measures of selectivity, which can also be called the effectiveness at institutions at excluding students. There are scores of books that focus on the ins and outs of elite college admissions, but many fewer that take a rigorous but sensitive look not at who gets excluded, but rather how institutions can work towards inclusion of the students they admit. And that is where the work of Professor Anthony Jack comes in. A native of Florida who attended a prep school through program A Better Chance, Professor Jack went to Amherst College, where he double majored in women's and gender studies and religion, but where he observed firsthand the diversity among lower income students, the privileged poor, those who enter college from boarding day and prep schools, and the doubly disadvantaged, those who enter college from distressed high schools. When he continued his studies at Harvard University, this became the topic of his research, interviewing students and developing a detailed understanding not only of their experiences, but also an understanding of how institutions can build inclusion and belonging on campus for all students. Professor Jack earned his PhD in sociology from Harvard in 2016, and then stayed on at Harvard to begin his career as a faculty member. He is a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows and an assistant professor of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He holds the Schutzer Assistant Professorship at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Professor Jack's scholarship appears in the Common Reader, Du Bois Review, Sociological Forum, and the Sociology of Education, and he's earned awards from the American Educational Studies Association, American Sociological Education, Association for the Study of Higher Education, Eastern Sociological Society, and the Society for the Study of Social Problems. He's had fellowships from the Ford Foundation and the National Science Foundation, and was a National Academy of Education Spencer Foundation Dissertation Fellow. But beyond the world of the academy, Professor Jack has also been a voice for advocacy and clarity on issues of access, diversity, and inclusion and belonging uh, in higher education more broadly. The range of publications that have featured his research and writing uh, includes not only prestigious, uh, prestigious venues and journals, uh, but it's just remarkably broad in scope. Uh, it includes the usual suspects, such as the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and the New Yorker. Uh, the higher education press, such as the Chronicle of Higher Education and Times Higher Education, uh, but also political magazines from across the spectrum, from the nation to the American Conservative Magazine to the National Review to Commentary and Vice and Vox. The Privileged Poor, How Elite Colleges Are Failing Disadvantaged Students is his first book. Uh, and for those of you who haven't read it yet, I recommend it highly. After Professor Jack's comments, he will be joined on screen by Professor Ted Mason, Associate Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and Professor of English for uh, some moderated Q&A and some questions from Professor Mason. Uh, if you have questions that you would like to submit, uh, please use the chat function to get them in the, uh, the queue for Q&A. Um, this has really been a painful year for many of us, a year full of pain and disruption uh, from the pandemic to repeated and escalating examples of racism and racial injustice, uh, and most recently uh, to the witness of insurrection fueled by rage and white supremacy in our nation's capital. Campuses are not immune from any of this. And in fact, uh, a review of our history, um, the history of uh, institutions across the country was showed that we are deeply intertwined with the, the complex and painful history of this nation. 
Uh, but the path forward, I think, the path forward for our institutions uh, and the path forward for our nation actually uh, hinges on our ability to create places uh, with true sense of inclusion and belonging and that are committed to the success of students. And in this context, I'd say uh, Professor Jack's work uh, is uh, more valuable than ever, not only to us at Kenyon, uh, but to uh, institutions around the nation. So it's my deep pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to introduce to you Professor Anthony Jack. So uh, Professor Jack, welcome to Kenyon, at least virtually. <laughs> thank you, thank you for, for having me. I have been looking forward to this event for, um, uh, since our first conversation, uh, when LaQuintus took, uh, put us in contact and, 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 and started this whole thing. So um, thank you all for permitting me to um, join you all here today. Um, I'm very much, especially today, I am very much interested in hearing directly from you all. And so I look, I look forward to um, joining Professor Mason in the, the, the Q&A. Because again, as the president said, so much has gone on in our nation and so much has gone on, especially in higher education because everything that has happened outside of it directly impacts what we do on our campuses and our students' homes and the like. And so I wanna give you all, a, a, to, to start a conversation about inequality in higher education, using the book as a touchstone to talk about very real issues. Because even though my, I am housed within a school of education, even though I am an assistant professor of education, I'm a sociologist of poverty and inequality, right? And that is at the, that is at the heart of my research and the heart of my advocacy and why I write for bigger audiences and, and do the work that I do. And the reason why I start there, because even though first generation college students make up roughly 50% of the students at four year institutions, they constitute only 14% of the undergraduates at the most competitive colleges, those who come from the bottom 50% of the income distribution. Instead of attending the most competitive colleges, those from lower income families are disproportionately relegated to community for profit and less selective, less selective colleges where resources are fewer and graduation rates are lower. This contrast is made even more striking when you consider that 38 colleges in America have more students from the top 1% than the bottom 60%. At Washington University in St. Louis, the ratio is almost four to one. And this disparity is especially troubling given that selective colleges like Amherst and Harvard, Michigan and Kenyon serve as mobility springboards for, for those from disadvantaged families compared to lower tier colleges. Those from poor families, but you have to realize, were once kept out of these bastions of privilege by a devilish duo. We were once excluded by lack of information on the one hand and tuition costs that rivaled or eclipsed our family's annual incomes on the other. But beginning with Princeton in 1998, some colleges began to take action. They began enacting no loan financial aid policies to combat the, strangle, the stranglehold of class inequalities that, that, that cripple our delicate democracy, but yet even more fragile system of higher education. Through these initiatives, colleges reached out to say that money will no longer be a barrier to entry. They will no longer curtail your success. But uncritically praising universities as democratic institutions for increasing access reflects a limited civic imagination. An admission letter and generous financial aid do not a diverse college make. Access is not inclusion. I worry sometimes if colleges have extended coveted invitations to eager, excited, able youth before adequately preparing for their arrival. But we have seen to forgotten no truth that citizenship is so much more than just being in a place. It's about accessing all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. You see, this is what I studied, but it's also what I lived and lived. Where are the other poor black folks? This was the first question I remember asking myself in 2003 as a freshman at Amherst Co College after partake, being invited to partake in what I now call those convocation conversations. And y'all know the chaps I'm talking about when people conveniently worked in verbal versions of their resume and narrated their summer schedules for any, for any and all to hear. My new peers swapped stories of multi-trips 
multi-week trips abroad and fancy parties at hosted at second homes. They talked about courtside seats to basketball games and private premieres to movies that had not yet hit theaters. These were class markers I associated with the rich. My first time on a plane was actually flying to, from Miami to Amherst for my recruiting trip. What I thought I found that day was the legacy of Bowen and Bach's groundbreaking study, The Shape of the River. You see, in this work, they, Bowen and Bach showed us that an overwhelming majority of Black students at elite colleges come from privileged backgrounds. The sons of daughters, the, daughters, the sons of lawyers, the daughters of doctors, the children of commerce. So I resigned myself to be yet again, the only poor black person at a rich white place. But imagine my surprise, however, when one of my classmates who studied abroad in Spain during her junior year of college, of high school, turned out to also come from a family that struggled to make ends meet. Feeling comfortable with each other, we shared stories of doing homework by candlelight. And we did this not to be romantic, but because the power was out. We knew a common struggle all too well that sometimes there was more months than money. The vacation homes my new peers ventured to, it turned out, were not always their own, but rather those from their wealthy high school peers. Alas, I was not the only one granted access to places and experiences that my family could not afford or that they even knew about. But here's the problem. Like my freshman imagination, social science research did not make space for these experiences part of the larger first-gen story. When social scientists wrote about lower income and first-generation college students, they wrote of a single story of a single story chronicling culture shock and isolation. Yet all the while, as my research was the first to uncover, colleges and universities were hedging their bets. They were getting their new diversity from old sources. The, Andos, the Andovers and Exeters, the St. Paul's and the Chokes of the world. So I set out to trouble the waters. The Privileged Poor focuses on life at pseudonymous renowned university. I sat down with 103 Black, White, and Latinx undergraduates and conducted ethnographic observations for two years to investigate what does it mean to be a student at renown. And I highlight how lower income undergraduates at Renown have shared beginnings, but lived ever more divergent lives en route to college. Because some attended elite boarding day and preparatory schools like Exeter, Choate, and Dalton, those whom I call the privileged poor. And I compare their experiences to equally economically distressed peers who enter from local, typically distressed public high schools, those who I call the doubly disadvantaged. Now, admittedly, these terms are loaded. And to be honest, my choice in terms is purposeful. In addition to the oxymoronic quality of privileged poor that sticks with you, to engage with or even find fault with the terms forces you to in interrogate what they intend to capture. How can one be both privileged and poor? Even using the qualifier doubly inspires an intersectional way of thinking about inequality when there previously wasn't one. But as I share with you, this is as much professional as personal. Because personally, I wanted to move the conversation away from individual differences to focus on how structural inequalities like segregation, joblessness, poverty, and the disinvestment in public K-12 through education manifest themselves on our campuses. My investigation into this overlooked diversity among lower income students pushes back against the dangerous downplaying of how prolonged exposure to savage inequalities in our neighborhoods and in our schools affect how students navigate college, if they make it there at all. For we cannot escape the fact that while in some neighborhoods and secondary schools keep us from hurt, harm, and danger, others place us in the thick of it. Conventional wisdom dictates you have to know where you're going. So you have to know where you've been to know where you're going. When it comes to understanding the undergraduate experience, the same sentiment is true. We, have, we must examine where students come from and what they have been through to understand why they chart the paths they do once they arrive on our college campuses. Which students immerse themselves into the college community? Who wants to leave after the first week? Who says of their experience, I couldn't breathe here? 
but who likens college to deja vu. To overlook the rich diversity of experiences within the first generation college student community is then to base policy on only a partial picture. As it stands now, our understanding of how poverty and inequality, class and culture shape college life remains incomplete and the policies we implement to help students simply miss the mark. For example, colleges expect students to be comfortable and proactive engaging and forging relations with faculty from the moment they step foot on campus. This is the road to letters of recommendations, extensions, extra help and internships. This is the road to emotional support when times get rough. Yet this expectation remains unsaid. There's no, there's no manual of do's or don'ts, when's or how's. And unspoken, if undergraduates want something, they will ask for it, operates as the gold standard. The college corollary to the squeaky wheel gets to Greece. Imagine the culture shock then that some first generation college students experience navigating that what, so, what sociologist Jean Anion calls the quote, hidden curriculum. Alice, a quick wear Latina with a penchant for short answers, attended a segregated public high school. She revealed to me that her four years before college was filled with peers fighting, setting trash cans on fire, and skipping school. For her teachers, maintaining order took precedence to teaching lessons. Her transition to college, needless to say, was rough. She doesn't feel at home at Renown, and she says that everything about this place contradicts everything about home. The people, the culture, the very buildings I walk on the way to class every day. Professors informally say, my door is always open, but she doesn't believe them. She feels, quote, too intimidated, too afraid to talk to people, and consequently rarely goes to school sponsored people for anything. In contrast, a goon, a reflective and discerning Latina who hails from a troubled neighborhood also, but she attended an elite boarding school with a $212 million endowment. Her largest class was 12 students. And contact with teachers who more likely had a PhD than not was an everyday occurrence. Studying abroad was not only an option, it was encouraged. Office hours were an old trick to her. She says, Tony, I feel empowered in, to go and talk to professors and say, hey, I want to meet with you. She goes on to say, my school instilled to me that I'm allowed to do that. It's actually my right. When her instructor was away from campus, a goon had no qualms calling his cell phone for prearranged virtual office hours, despite her friend's surprised looks. You see, what was new for Alice was old for a goon. What was a mismatch for Alice was a match for a goon. And these, these differences reflect not individual differences in student, but rather societal defects. But here's how the problem gets compounded. Colleges reward students accordingly. One residential advisor shared with me that when it comes to nominating students for prizes, awards, and fellowships, she says, the process is relationship dependent, unfortunately. Oftentimes, the best candidates are not put forward. It's hard to tease out what is nepotism, cronyism, favoritism, or whatever you want to call it. Undergraduates from America's forgotten neighborhoods and ignored schools are truly disadvantaged as colleges continue to privilege privilege. But I am not so naive. Knowing how to navigate relationships with faculty and deans is not the only hurdle that lower income and first generation college students face. There are things that no amount of cultural capital can combat. Where Alice and Agoon's experiences align, their shared economic disadvantage is more salient in shaping their college experiences. You see, typically walking around co camp college campuses in March, you hear stories of trips home to rest, Europe for backpacking, Mexico for partying. Spring break, however, means something wholly different for lower income students. As Valeria, a lower income Latina from California laments, there's always famine during spring break. You see, Alice and Agoon both know hunger sting all too well and not just from when food stamps ran out at home. You see, their college assumes that all students depart campus for fun in the sun. And so Renown closes all eateries during spring break. 
And these closures result in one out of every seven students having to fend for themselves during spring break. To put this in context for you, at a school, one of the wealthiest universities in the world, with a multi-billion dollar endowment, one out of every seven students must schedule a time on their calendar where they must combat food insecurity. And closures, sadly, are a common college practice. Of the nearly 80 colleges that have adopted no loan financial aid policies, only one in five, when I was doing the study, kept their dining halls open without restriction. When one's pocket is as empty as one's stomach, you are more worried about your next meal than recounting trips to the West Tinsbury market. Nicole, a lower income black student who spent, who went to a private boarding school, she says, spring break is the most blatant break in where privilege play a role in whether you leave or whether you stay. As Maria, a lower income Latina asks, how can you support yourself if you can't even feed yourself? a question that many student, many of our students today are having to deal with due to being off campus during COVID-19 or the greater insecurity that their families are now facing due to layoffs and medical emergencies. But you see, capturing this harsh reality with comedic seriousness, Ariana says that, quote, spring break is the real Hunger Games, end quote, and the odds are never in poor students' favor. But just how close it comes to living in the districts is downright depressing. At a conference where, where students from all over the country discussed what it meant to be a first generation college student, one young white woman with a pixie haircut and wearing a sweatshirt with Columbia University stitched across her chest stood brave in a room full of people. She wanted to discuss spring break. Looking at me as if for courage, she revealed how she spent her last spring break at again, a multi-billion dollar and multi-billion dollar endowed institutions. She increased her online dating activity in the week leading up to spring break to secure dates the following week. You see, banking on gender norms of older men paying for the first date, she felt that her only option was to use OkCupid as if it were DoorDash, Tinder as if it were Grubhub. In order to eat, she offered her time. Yet this is life for far too many undergraduates. Furthermore, it goes beyond just what poor students face. What about the students who don't have a home to go back to? What about those students who know that home and harm are synonymous? New students require taking on new responsibilities. We must move from access to inclusion. We must ensure that social class, whether symbolically or materially, does not keep lower income students in secondary positions at first rate institutions. To embark upon the crucial and noble task of making colleges look more like the world and not just the top 1%, we must question what we take for granted. For as each class becomes ever more diverse, we have to realize that colleges' connections to once overlooked communities become more pronounced and stronger. For these new ties bring various inequalities into sharper and sharper relief. I hope that the privileged poor not only sheds light on the problems at hand, but also provides a framework for addressing them, not just during quote unquote normal times, but also during unprecedented times that we find ourselves in right now. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Jack for his uh, in inspiring and enlightening words. Professor Jack and I shared airtime earlier this year uh, on an NPR show and I'm very glad to sort of see him in person, as it were, about as close to in person as we can get. Uh, my job uh, is to uh, propose some questions to Professor Jack, uh, many of which have been sent uh, by the audience. I do have one question uh, I'd like to begin with, Professor Jack, that your observations early on in your, in your comments raised, and it has to do with the financial model of post-secondary higher education in the United States. Specifically, uh, it's dependence upon tuition dollars. 
And this is true for not only obviously private institutions, but true for public institutions as well. Um, what do you think are the implications, uh, the larger implications of, of a system of post-secondary higher ed so dependent on, uh, on tuition dollars? I mean, I think that's a, that's a great place to start. I, I think, you know, we can talk about it in, in three different ways. I mean, we saw part of it with respect to varsity, Operation Varsity Blues, right? Part of that, the reason why that was, was um, was possible. It, was, it wasn't just because of the exercise of privilege. It was also because there was so much pressure on universities to balance budgets or get money either way that what we see are people being able to cheat the system, which only, which only serves to reinforce the already unequal um, treatment and admissions that legacy and high donors are able to um, benefit from. Right, we, um, I wrote a piece for the New York Times invited me to review um, the, um, they invited me to review, oh shoot, I can't remember, I forgot the damn book's name. Um, <laughs> the two, the book on Varsity Blues and then um, Jeff Salingo's new book. Um, I can't remember, I can't remember, I can't remember forget, forgetting the names, but they invited me to review these two books in conversation and to move it beyond the books, I, I raise a larger question. We are about to see, we are at, we are at, at this in this current moment waiting on the debates around affirmative action with a now right-leaning um, court. We are seeing greater and greater attacks on affirmative action, and yet the two biggest, the three biggest groups that benefit from preferential treatment in, in admissions are not talked about. Athletes, legacies, and high, and high income families who can provide donorship. And so when we think about the way in which admissions become shaped by this model, um, we're, we begin to get in trouble. But also we think about what schools are able and not able to do. Because a lot of the research, that I, the, the reason why I was inspired by, inspired to do this research is the only univer the universities that are more able to keep their graduation rates high, not because they, not because of anything that they're doing special, except they have more resources to have more ha more hands on deck. Fewer students are falling through the cracks. So I'm trying to figure out from the tuition model that we are forced to be in, who is able to get in and who is getting the preferences of getting in, but also what happens when students get on campus? What are the, what is the money being actually used for? And we're more dealing with, let's make our dorms pretty than actually make our campuses livable to all students. And so I wanna talk about that frame. And then the last thing I would say is what happens when students get out? Are students making choices that align with their personal interests or are they trying to get this so they can help pay back the loans they took out for graduation? Are we really interested in the careers that we're going, that our students are going after? Or is there another influence that, another influence that is diverting them from, from, passion to, from passion to paying back loans? And so the larger question is, what will we do as a country knowing that we are only as strong, not only as uh, educated citizenry, but a diverse educated citizenry. And so those are questions that I want to have with this tuition model that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, thank you very much. I mean, this is, these are sort of large and, and immensely complicated questions that we're engaging here. It seems to me, and you can tell me if I'm right about this, that one of the things that your study gets us to focus on is a kind of paradox of two different versions of mobility. Mm. One of them is the is the the mobility supposedly that you accrue uh, achieve, let's say, by um, going to, uh, for lack of a better term, I'm going to use this good post secondary schools, and that gives you a certain mobility post graduation. But it seems to me that from your remarks um, earlier this evening that you were thinking also appropriately about well, what what about mobility inside the institution that's supposed to give you mobility beyond it. Yes. Is, that, is that a fair assessment? Yes, absolutely right. Um, you know, Harvard, Amherst, Kenyon, UVA, Michigan are, can serve as mobility springboards for many groups. Mm -hmm. But how big of a boost it gives you depends on what happens between convocation and commencement. 
do you have connections to faculty and staff and administrators who can write you a letter of recommendation? Do you, have you immersed yourself enough into campus that you got help on your resume and cover letter so your material is polished when you go for a job as compared, polished and edited by a professional and not just polished in the way that you know that you have, you know, subject verb agreement all the way throughout, right? Mm -hmm. Is it tailored enough? Are you getting that kind of advice? The example that I use um, is the Rhodes, you know, the Rhodes, the, Rhodes, the Rhodes scholarship to be able to go to Oxford for two years. Mm -hmm. What many people don't realize is how many letters you actually need when you apply. It's upwards of eight. Mm -hmm. How many people of any age have eight people that can write strongly on their behalf, let alone students who have been through a university. Um, how many people can say I have eight, um, like six faculty members and two staff members who can write a letter for me? Because, and, and, it, and, it, and it gets even more complicated because you can be a 4.0 student, but what if, I don't say that's all you are, but what if that is your distinguishing characteristic is your 4.0, but you have somebody else who has a 3.85, but this person went to office hours. They babysat a professor's cat. They worked in a professor's lab. They developed, you know, they, they turned the professor into an advisor and an advisor to a mentor. That person's letter is going to have details that an interviewer or reader is going to remember when they're sitting in committee and they're reading a hundred files each, who's going to come top of mind, mm -hmm. right? So it's about what happens in that experiential core of college life, right? That, that the four years between convocation and commencement, because we spend so much time focused on who gets in and where they go after that we forget how the four years talk. And I saw in the, the chat that the two books are unacceptable and who gets in and why. Mm -hmm. And those two books also focus so much on who gets in, but they bring up diff they bring our they bring attention to different forms of inequality in it. But then it's almost as if all of that stops the day you drop someone off on, on, on the campus. No. Who has the ability to join four clubs versus who has to work four jobs? Mm -hmm. Who is able to afford all the books for class versus who has to go to the library um, and, and photocopy certain things or wait until you, know, you can get a chapter scanned and you know, scan and deliver? Um, and I want more people to, but even then, who has the time to even get to know how to use the resources like the library, mental health services, career services, as compared to uh, a student whose parents can teach them what office hours are from day one. Mm -hmm. Because they're, because, and that's why I wanna push us to think about the hidden curriculum because when, when we think about office hours, we always say when they are, we never say what they are. As faculty members, administrators and staff. I traveled the country as part of this book tour and I still haven't met 20 faculty members who before engaging with my work had defined office hours on their syllabi or on the, in their classes to actually give a robust definition so that students can have something to grapple onto. But what if you already know and you come to my office hours the first week and all of a sudden you're my RA by the end of the semester, you get a letter from me and a paycheck. And so all of these things matter for how you are able to parlay your degree with your career. Thank you. Uh, I'm perusing the questions in the chat, <clears throat> and there are a number of, of tremendous questions. And from my reading of them, they break really down into four categories. Mm -hmm. um, and they are as follows. Uh, and these are in no particular order, just as I cast my eye across the list here. One of them is, what can uh, institutions and also professionals at institutions of higher education do to help ameliorate the situations you're describing. Two, what can students uh, of either the, the, of the privileged, uh, what can the privileged poor or the doubly disadvantaged who are have matriculated, what strategies might they begin to adopt 
mm -hmm. um, to, to achieve that greater mobility and greater level of comfort. Uh, then uh, another set, a third set is um, what professionals uh, in secondary schools uh, might do to begin to help prepare their students. And the third is, the fourth rather, is what students at, at secondary schools themselves might begin to do. So if we could, uh, and I will, you know, as we move through those, I will see if I can frame the questions a little bit more sharply. Um, for instance, there's a question here that says, uh, in your opinion, what language, what approaches tend to work best to increase the likelihood that a struggling low-income student will follow through on an email invitation to set up a meeting with a faculty or a staff member? And this is particularly important, obviously. And again, this, this is a metaphor for a larger question, which is, all right, when, when you don't, when you aren't fully acculturated, again, I'm using that very advisedly, mm -hmm. all right, what does that request to come to office hours mean to you? Right. How, what does it signify? So how can we, as, as education professionals, help overcome whatever resistance or reluctance uh, we might find from our students? Yes, and I, I think this is gonna tackle um, bucket one and two. We have to work very hard, and actually probably bucket number four as well. We have to work very hard to remind ourselves and to remind students that help seeking is not a sign of weakness, but rather a sign of strength, right? Help seeking for me is, no, is, is you are smart enough to understand Right, you are, you are smart enough to determine that you are approaching the boundaries of your own understanding. And you are, again, smart enough to know that to lean on someone else's expertise as guide mm -hmm. or know that the path that you are about to travel is best done with others than alone. Right, when you refashion help seeking in that way, help seeking doesn't mean um, you're not worthy, you were at Mitch's mistake. If you, if you need help, you probably shouldn't be here because only people who, people who really should get it are people who should be here. No, we need to refashion what help seeking is, right? Building a support network is part of the college experience. And we have to be careful and be honest about it because many of our students come from families where they're, their guardians kept their job for 20, 30, and 40 years by not making a fuss, mm -hmm. by not, by, by, by just showing up, doing good work. We've been told when you get to school, try your best, get good grades, don't embarrass me. There was no discussion about if you need something, ask for it, make your needs known. That, that's not what a lot of students hear. And this goes beyond just lower income first gen. Many, many, you know, many women are not taught to make their needs or wants known um, in institutions as well. We need to refashion what help seeking is, is, is viewed as because a lot of people think when they get the email of saying, hey, come to my office hours, it's like being called to the principal's office. And you're taking that long walk from your you know, that long walk from your classroom to the main, to the front of the school, and you have no idea why you've been called. But if we actually start from the very beginning and say, hey, my office hours are not just Tuesday from three to four, but my office hours are a time for us to talk about X, discuss Y, and go deeper on Z. And I view this and I dedicate this time to you. So that means later on in the semester, when I say, hey, come to my office hours, I want to talk to you about this. It's not, oh shoot, I'm in trouble. No, that's, that's not what's going on. It's something much more organic, much more beneficial for the professor and for the student. But we have to, we have to lay the groundwork first about what we are actually expecting of students. If not, there will always be that adversarial relationship. Another thing that we have to do is we also have to be very um, true to ourselves. Students can see through the BS of trying to pretend to be more than, uh, you know, when people try to be too down, too woke, too into something and it's clear that it's not there, that's, don't be inauthentic with it. So for me, my students know that I knit, that I love, you know, I, I love speculative fiction and Harry Potter and N.K. Jemison and all that, and, and, and LeVar Burton and things like that. 
And so sometimes that's the icebreaker, right? But I don't, I am, you know, those are things that I share so that students know that, you know, I don't just sit at a computer and write books and articles all the time. That's like, this is part of my own. And, and what faculty are willing to share about why they got into this role and why they do it and what inspires and what keeps them going, students are able, you never know what's going to be that, that piece, that word that you say that a student is going to, that you're going to, that, that you're going to make a student feel super comfortable with you in that moment. And so I think we have to set the groundwork for understanding why building networks is important in college. It's not sucking up or kissing butt or cheating. It's actually the new rules that you are expected to abide by, except no one says it. It is the one of the most valuable skills because when you get promoted um, at a job, it's usually done because you have a network of people, you, you've um, impressed people who are your peers and your superiors. So you don't have to be this isolated person doing everything on your own. And so how do we address the more systemic issue of the framing around what does seeking help and understanding what support is before we just try to put a bandaid on something. Let's get, let's, let's treat the causal root of understanding, hey, these are, this is what you, this is what's newly expected of you in college. And this is one exercise that you really should practice. And that is coming to office hours so that you can understand the material because for the students on here, the best, the best thing about office hours, even if you're just like a pure academic person is you learn how professors think, right? You know, you can go to a textbook or, you know, all day and learn how that person asks questions, but that person isn't writing your test. When you start to think about how those it, it, it professors have a little quick thing, a little quirk in their questions, you, 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 you begin to piece the stuff together through office hours because it can be better for your grades too, in addition to the social benefits. I'd, I'd like to, to expand this uh, slightly um, because uh, we've been, you've been speaking about, um, let's say um, academic, the academic division and faculty. But we have a question here from a person in the, in the audience who says, uh, what can college ministries or churches or other religious organizations do to help support students, uh, support disadvantaged students at colleges? And I would see if we could elaborate that to sort of beyond simply, certainly college ministries and religious organizations, but basically the non-academic side, okay, of institutions. What can they do? Because I would observe something um, that on the one hand, we have this over the last two decades, an increase in this sense of discomfort and disquiet, or at least more public with the sense of discomfort and disquiet, even as post-secondary higher education institutions have taken great pains to increase what we could call, for lack of a better term, student services. Hmm. So can you can you comment on that? What what the non-academic side can do to help? Yeah. I mean the thing is if um and sometimes uh it's something that people don't notice until the very end of the book. I never enter the classroom in the book. Mm -hmm. Everything I talk about is outside of the pure academic. Um, I'm learning Carbonyl chemistry. I'm learning Foucault style of the debate. Like everything is about the interpersonal dynamics. And one of the things that we can do best is we really need to understand the inequality in America. Mm -hmm. Mental health services is one of the most important offices on campus. And, and yet their visibility, prevalence and support usually is dwarfed by the resources to career services and other, and other, and other dynamics. We need to be prepared to understand where students are coming from because our, because the more diverse the class, the, the more diverse the set of problems that students are going to be dealing with. Are we prepared to help a student through the death of a grandparent, um, which is, which is earth shattering, um, yet it's a modal life event for people of a certain age range, given generational de de demographics. Mm -hmm. But when you start to diversify your campus, 
what happens when you start seeing um, death due to drive-by shootings, death due to mine accidents, death due to um, local or geographic specific reasons? Are you prepared to help us through and through those? So that's responding to the bad, but also think about the fact that you have such a diverse set of students coming. How do you begin to approach them in a way that's actually inviting? And so it's about adjusting, it's about adjusting our practices. Like how do we reach out? Because so many of those offices that you mentioned play catcher. Mm -hmm. I remember I've, I've done a lot of work with career service and mental health services at uh, colleges across the country. And they all, they all describe to me, oh, we, in the end of the conversation, we, we, we usually wait for students to come talk to us. And, and then we really help those students. And, and my question is always, but, you know, I, was talk, I, don't, I don't get into like the academic selection bias type of garden, like, but what about the students who don't know who you are mm -hmm. and what you do? What are ways in which that I honestly, to, to fully answer your question, I think we need to fundamentally rethink and reshape orientation because many orientations across the country is basically a fall retreat for wealthy families. Who's able to come and stay three to five days in a hotel and walk around campus and go to the campus store and, and buy matching hats and shirts and take selfies and all that kind of stuff like that. But what happens if we actually fundamentally change what orientation is to be something that give all students a localized knowledge of people in place mm -hmm. so that these offices aren't foreign. Like you can still make it fun, whether you're doing a scavenger hunt or where's Waldo or like taking over like flag, you know, flag football for the entire campus, like just take over, have fun with it, but do, do it in such a way where students are gaining a knowledge of, of where they are, who's with them, and a framework for who they're supposed to be as, you know, as a student on this on this campus. That can really help because all of those services are part of what makes Kenyon Kenyon, what makes Amherst Amherst, right? Yeah. That's important. I mean, and it, it also seems too that one of the things we're thinking about is perhaps, as you say, this sort of rethinking um, orientation of something, something that happens at the beginning of the first year you know, the first week, the first two weeks, and goes sort of beyond, is staged in different ways. I'm wondering too, and I'd like to, to um, uh, ask a, a, another uh, question from one of our, from one of our audience. And do you, did you, in your research, do you see sort of, you know, when we think of the, uh, if you were to say to someone conventionally privileged, poor, or doubly disadvantaged, they might very well imagine that you're talking about a kind of urban population. Did you see something similar in sort of the, the students you were speaking to who are from rural areas? Yes, absolutely. And that's why, and that's why I mentioned specifically about mental health services and understanding how to help a student through, um, through family dynamics that are more urban where right, when we see like death through a certain way, but also more rural from the closing of minds to um, people, you know, a generation of people who are dealing with black lung, right? For those of you, for those who work in more mining areas, a lot of the men die very young because of black lung if they had, uh, you know, work in their minds and different things like that. We need to be prepared for that. So my work, when it comes to privileged poor and double disadvantage, privileged poor are lower income students who have access to the academic and social experiences usually reserved for the top 1%. Their home origin does not, doesn't matter if they're rural, suburban, um, or, or urban, because we also forget about rural poverty, because that's a very real thing that people don't want, that people don't talk about. Double disadvantage are lower income students who enter college without that kind of cultural capital. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, it's about talking about the over diversity among lower income and first generation college students than a specific regional effect. There are many students in the book who come from more, um, um, more rural backgrounds. I'm thinking about a student whose pseudonym is Ryan um, in the study. And he, I remember he, he, he told me, he was like, I'm from the, um, you know, I can, 
you know, when I think when you think when you think Hatfields and McCoy, you think of me. When you I come from the hollows of West Virginia, and when I came to school, the the thing that I was afraid the most about is um, where can I find some smoking tobacco? And like we talked about it, and he felt at home in the conversation with me. Uh, be one because of my uh, southern roots, at least technically, um, and we had these real, real conversations about what does it mean to come to a school that was, you know, adjacent to a big city, but just coming to a school where, like, the culture shock is from how people speak, dress, how fast they walk, the pace of the school, the 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 just the, the the type of socializing was very very different, but it doesn't matter about the rural. There are specific, there are unique challenges to come from urban and rural, but the but the overarching category of that kind of jump is very very similar. I'd like to. Uh, there are a number of questions that focus on a particular issue that I want to raise for you and see what your thoughts are, and that is. What advice might you have to educational professionals who themselves um, were either doubly disadvantaged or part of the privileged poor, yeah. who've made it, who've progressed through the system, gotten a certain amount of mobility and are back at educational institutions and themselves quite conscious of, of having been students, very yeah. much like the ones about in whom they have considerable interest. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, if those individuals are comfortable doing so, you know, sharing their sh sharing aspects of the discussing aspects of applying the school the, about their mobility project is some is sometimes quite powerful for students. Now, but not I don't want to I don't want to be prescriptive and say everyone should because not everyone is comfortable doing so, and not everyone is confident when they do. But if it's part of it, that's something. But more, I think more importantly is, I think institutions need to listen to those members of staff and, um, and, and administrators when they discuss policies that they believe or are seeing that are disproportionately hurting the most vulnerable students, even if they don't frame it as, hey, as a first generation college student, I think this program is wrong. They can frame it as, you know, this program specifically you know, overburdens our most vulnerable students, but listening to those individuals who have higher um, higher frequency of contact with students more generally, but especially those who have similar life experiences, because students typically seek those people out, especially if it's known. As a faculty member for myself, I can't tell you how many students like. Their email starts, Tony, as a first year as a college student, as a, you know, as a lower income student, you know, I read your work or I saw you and I want to talk to you. I'm also a Head Start kid, right? A lot of that starts in the exact same spot. And I, I, I accept that as, you know, as my role, why I'm, why I'm here, right? It's not just to publish, it's to also be that person. But universities also need to listen to those who may not have the New York Times as a platform, but who know intimately what students on campus are dealing with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. And I want to say on behalf of, the, of our audience, since we are moving near time, I wanted to end up with one last question to get your brief thoughts about it. And that's this. Does it make sense at all for institutions such as Kenyon and other post-secondary higher education, ed institutions of post-secondary higher ed, to find ways of ensuring that students understand that struggle of a certain kind is appropriate and struggle of another kind is not appropriate and how to distinguish between those two. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's one of the hardest things to learn. And even as someone who is in a much better position than he was in 2003 when I entered Amherst, you know, I still struggle with that. I, it is, you don't want to become, you don't want to go, you don't want that pendulum to swing when you become so dependent on others that you can't even do simple things on your own. But 
college and life in general is not about being a lone wolf. It is about building that intergenerational network of peers, people who are immediately older, people and who can be mentors and learn from those individuals who have charted a path or a similar path before you. It's about learning from both their mistakes and successes and being smart enough to stitch together, stitch together your, own, your own plan. There is no surefire quick answer to understanding what are burdens that are supposed to be bore alone and others that you're supposed to share the load with other people. That will be a forever lifelong struggle. What I will say is this, do, for all the students and faculty and staff on this, on, this email, on this call too, don't do other people's jobs and yours. If someone is there to help you with your paperwork for study abroad, rely on that person to help you with your paperwork for study abroad. If this person goes to help you with your medical papers, don't beat yourself up for not, for not understanding the Byzantine like bureaucratic nightmare that is American healthcare. If someone's title is what you are spending hours doing, that may be an indication that a sign that you may need to share that load with that person. I've helped a number of people in their negotiation as faculty for, for a job and the like. And one person was an international student and she spent a week trying to do all the paperwork herself. And I said to her, I said, let's call the institution right now and ask for the visa director. She got on the phone within five minutes. She said, oh, I've already have all this information ready for you. You're, you're all set, right? If someone's title is what you have been beating your head up against, reach out, it's time to reach out to that person and let them do their job. Well, thank you very much. That's an appropriate and fitting end of our hour. I want to thank Professor Anthony Abraham Jack for his wonderful thoughts and words this evening. I want to thank everyone, first of all, virtual and real. Uh, I want to thank our audience for being here and providing a host of questions, uh, illuminating ones, to be sure. And I want to uh, encourage all of us to continue thinking about these issues that Professor Jack has raised for us, that his work continues to raise for us, uh, in the hopes of improving our in, in, improving Kenyan and institutions like, like Kenyan. Thank you, and good night. Thank you all.